Welcome to Women of Courage Season 2. I'm Alison Hankel, sitting in for your host, Anne Miner. You may recognize me from a previous episode. Yes, I am proud to be a Woman of Courage. Guests on Women of Courage are women from all walks of life who have faced significant life challenges with their health, family, career or business, in fact, every aspect of their lives. Our Women of Courage have found the strength and the courage to confront, to overcome, and to succeed in spite of everything. We share Anne's hope that our stories will encourage and inspire you as you face your own challenges, that you will take action to courageously pursue your own dreams and passions, no matter what obstacles are presented along the way. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Woman of Courage. If I were shared vision of a vibrant Canada. To learn more, visit the new volunteer.ca, your connection to Canada's volunteering community. What would I do today if I were brave? Welcome back to Women of Courage. With us today is Linda Jacklin. Hi Linda, and thanks for joining us. Hi Allison, and it's so nice to be here. I appreciate this opportunity. So we're just gonna have you start your story wherever you feel comfortable starting out. Well then I guess I will start um, from my childhood. I was raised in a great home in most ways, a Christian home. My parents were amazing parents, but there was abuse going on inside our home that they didn't know about. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail over that. It didn't seem like a terrible thing to me. It just seemed like what everybody did. I didn't realize that it was something that you weren't supposed to do. And by the time I did realize that it had stopped, so it didn't seem like a horrible catastrophe to me other than I felt lonely when it was over. And so I made the decision that I was going to get as much attention as possible. And I can remember the day I decided that's it for me. I am going to be and do whatever I want to do. If I'm going to be good, I'll be the best. But if I'm going to be bad, I'll probably do that too. And that's what I did really. I decided to get married at 14 years old and my parents signed for me. So that was the beginning, I guess, of the next part of my life. We were married eight years and I had two little boys and the marriage didn't work out well, not particularly for anyone's fault except the fact that I was 14. He was 18, we weren't too bright. So my uh, youngest son at that time was a year and a half old and I met a man very quickly after I was divorced and got remarried. The reason I got remarried in reality is, the fa is because I was horseback riding and got thrown off a horse and hurt my tailbone and the man that I was out with moved into my house to look after my children. And I guess I figured he's here, I'll keep him. That's really what happened to me. So we were um, excited actually about being married and we were going out to a church in Woodstock and loving everything that was happening in our lives. And we decided to go on the mission field. So we were sent to Quebec, he was French Canadian. We went to Quebec and we um, were in Bible school for four years and come out of there going to go to Mali as missionaries. But I found out that our children would have to be put into um, a home for kids, the school system and we'd only get to have them every three months. So that was a no-go for me, I couldn't do that. By this time we'd had a little girl as well. So we stayed in Quebec and we were missionaries for 16 years while we were there. But behind closed doors things weren't good. He was a wonderful, loving, gentle man, but he was emotionally ill and very abusive. And so I didn't tell anyone for a long, long time. It was. Um, such a secret for, s and I guess that's because of being missionaries. Who do you talk to? You couldn't very well go to your pastor since he was the pastor. And you certainly couldn't tell the mission board because obviously they wouldn't have let him continue. And then what would happen? I felt like I'd ruin his reputation and definitely hurt the kids. So they didn't even know what was happening. It was completely when they weren't there. And it started out so small. It was just a little push or um, saying something like, 
you didn't discipline the children right. It's not them that needed spanking, it's you. It's not them that need to be disciplined, it's you. So it was very slow and gradual, and I believed him that I was the fault. He was a wonderful guy that everybody loved, thought, wow, what a great guy he is, so soft and gentle, and he was. But because he was emotionally ill, he took it too far. So he just pushed the paddle once too many times, I think. And it started, like I said, with little things, but it ended up being um, serious, serious abuse. And he was so suicidal, he was very, very depressed. So because, I think because he was suicidal, he wanted me with him so much of the time. And after leaving, we left the mission field after 16 years. And we moved to Calgary, Alberta, actually. And um, while we were there, my husband was driving city bus in Calgary. We were out of the mission field. I was working full time, but it, I wasn't allowed to work for very long. He got um, more and more emotional, more depressed, and needed me with him. So he was riding a, driving a bus. I was riding in the back seat. <laughs> and that went on for many hours, many, many days in a row. And then along came my youngest son. And so the being with him, I had a choice. Do I leave the baby with my 11-year-old daughter while I ride the bus? Do I take him with me? How do I do this? And for a long time, either my boys or my daughter together would look after the baby while I went with him on the bus. All this time, he was wonderful in every aspect, except if I did something that he thought was wrong, he believed that he was supposed to discipline me. So it wasn't because he was a mean, rotten, angry man. It was completely a mental illness. And I didn't see it. I loved him so much, and I, d I didn't believe doctors. They said, he's having migraine headaches, and this is to control you. He has back problems, but there's no real back problems. This is all a way to control you and to keep you close. I don't really know why he'd be worried about me not being close, but it seemed to be his biggest fear was me leaving, and so going out alone was a lot of the reason why he wanted me to stay home. I remember one time I was going to go to a girlfriend's house, and we were going to make um, spaghetti or something. I can't even remember what it was now. And egg rolls, that's what it was. I'd never made egg rolls. And my husband called me, and I wasn't at home. My daughter answered the phone. And so he called the house where he was, and he said, I'll be waiting for you when you get home. And I was terrified. I knew this was probably going to be pretty bad. And that night, I thought I would die. That night, he um, choked me, and I thought probably my life would be over. But it didn't end that way. And I'm really thankful that uh, I do believe that God had a plan for my life, that it, wouldn't, it wasn't going to end there. It wasn't going to end from my husband taking my life. So with, you're, you're in Calgary, you have four children now, mm -hmm. and you're 16 plus years into a marriage that is filled with abuse inside, but nobody can see that from the outside. And so that's a, a lonely spot to be, I'm sure. And you're trying to deal with all of these issues without telling anyone because you don't mm -hmm. want to ruin his reputation. And there's a... Um, a thought of what you should be like having been a missionary couple and so you're trying to juggle all of this and keep kind of all of these balls in the air at That's the same it, exactly. time. That's exactly. That is completely it. Yeah. And trying to not let the kids know. Like. I think that's the, one of the worst things I kept thinking, how would they ever control, what would they do when they go to school if, mm -hmm. if somebody talks about getting into a fight, my kids, that's something that wasn't allowed and we never ever talked about violence and they never saw it. So my big fear was that they would find out. And I did everything in my power to maybe push his buttons when the kids weren't home. Really, that's about it. I knew when it was, when it was time I was going to get in trouble. It would build up and build up. And I would, that's exactly what I did, push his buttons while the kids weren't home so it would happen when they weren't there. And he didn't leave marks on me, not where it was visible, not for the first very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so I kept the secret. I didn't have friends. That was part of no going to the store on my own and no friends, no coffee, no none of that kind of thing. So it was easy. It was pretty easy to just say, 
maybe it isn't really this bad and if I would just make him happier, if I would just discipline the kids better, if I would just not make him upset after all, he's the good, wonderful guy that everybody loves and I've always been a bit of a troublemaker so <laughs> I, I figured that it was my fault and I guess um, the fact that I blamed myself it was easy for him to continue. I didn't do a lot to help him stop. Okay. All right, please stay with us and we will be back uh, to continue the story with Linda Jackman. What would I do today if I were brave? What would I do? In September of 1845, Lord Metcalf, the Governor General of Canada, allotted five acres of land to Oxford County as the site of an annual county fair. The agreement stipulated that the site would be used for no other purpose and also included a provision that no admission fee should ever be charged for any event held on the grounds. It was originally located on the fringe of Woodstock, not in the middle of the town as it is today. The fair became nomadic in 1873 when the county sold the land to the city of Woodstock. It was rededicated Victoria Park on May 24, 1896 in commemoration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. The 138th Battalion, Oxford's own, paraded there in 1916 before leaving for France to fight in the trenches of World War I. Until development began in Southside Park in the early 1920s, Victoria Park was home to local baseball and lacrosse teams. To find out more, contact the Woodstock Museum at www.woodstockmuseum.ca. Babies need lots of your loving care and attention for healthy development. Encouraging smiles and smiling back, picking them up when they cry, and soothing them will help to fully develop their young brain. These everyday moments do matter. To help your baby grow and thrive, visit HealthyBabyHealthyBrain.ca. That's HealthyBabyHealthyBrain.ca. Welcome back to Women of Courage and to our guest, Linda Jacklin. So Linda, you are in Calgary. You have your children, but not your extended family. Your life is not kind of going as you had planned it to go. So you know, continue with your story and let us know how you got from there to where you are now. Well, uh, as I said before, my husband was suicidal. So he had tried to, to um, kill himself a couple of times, but mostly he wanted us to die with him. He would say, I love you so much that I want you to die with me. My two older boys were out of the house. My daughter I had sent back to Ontario to be with my parents. And so there was just the baby and I in the house. And he was a year and a half old then. He was in bed sleeping in the afternoon. My husband took an overdose of medication, held a shotgun to me. And before the medication took effect, he thought that he would kill me and then die. But my little one woke up and he told me to go ahead and get him. My oldest son had called me at uh, just partway through the afternoon and he said, Mom, I know there's something wrong. Can you tell me what's going on? And I said, no. And he took a rifle in his car into the parking lot in the back of our house and tried to get a shot off at his father, which is horrifying to me that he's had to live with that all this time. So when his father fell to the ground, the shotgun went off, blew a hole in the wall, and there's no more secret because when you call 911, the police, the ambulance, the fire department all come and the people in the neighborhood stand out in their lawns and say, what are those crazy Christians doing? So my husband was put in the psychiatric ward. Um, we eventually were divorced and I came back to Ontario. And instead of, I guess, doing what I really thought thought that I would. I thought that I would get my life together and everything would be fine. But it wasn't fine and I didn't, um, I just, I didn't talk about it. Eventually started drinking, doing as much drinking as possible, trying to make it all go away and it wouldn't do that. I tried drugs, that didn't make it go away either. And then I was on a motorcycle and riding to Toronto um, to do some kind of a ride, to raise money for the Women's Teen Challenge in Toronto. And my appendix burst. I did manage to get home with my motorcycle <laughs> before I called 911 and went to the hospital. Um, but because of that, I laid in bed for almost seven months. And during that time, I studied a program called Celebrate Recovery, 
was involved in our church and started that. Our, our church was wonderful and very much encouraged us to do that. So it was a program for addictions, for abuse, for, and I just felt like it was so in my scope of things, like this is where I was supposed to be. So we got very involved in Celebrate Recovery and during that period of time, there were a few of us that were sitting in a cafeteria, as you well know, <laughs> sitting in a cafeteria and talking about how badly we need um, some kind of ministry for women that go to churches that have some kind of faith base and they don't have anywhere to go because we're so busy hiding, trying to pretend, wow, I, don't, I, I have to be perfect like everybody else in there. That's what we think. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the pastors heard us talking. We all got together. We formed a board of directors for New Hope Family Ministries, which you were the treasurer. And that's yeah. so interesting how we've gotten together again. <laughs> Now, New Hope Family Ministries is here in Woodstock, and I'm the executive director, mm -hmm. and I'm doing what I always dreamt would happen, that all the abuse and the hurt and the drugs and the alcohol wouldn't turn me into something that's horrible. God would take the mess that I was and make it a message. And I feel like that's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. I really feel like this is, um, I've been given a second chance to make life worthwhile for not just myself, but helping other people get through it. I think once you've gone through it yourself and you've, you've accomplished it, you're not a victim. I'm certainly not a victim. Um, I'm very victorious in the way I live. And I, in fact, it's hard for me to talk about the past because it seems like it's someone else because my life is amazing now. And the women that I see on a daily basis they know that they can talk to me because I've already been there. I've already been in that situation, so I think it makes it easier. I went back to school. Um, in fact, I'm going again in a month to take some hard courses. I should be retiring, but I don't really think there's any retiring when you've come through that kind of a lifestyle. Um, I just feel like there's so much more to this than there has to be a reason behind all of this. I think we can take our hurts and we can live in the victim mentality or we can get through them and work them out with someone and then use our life to help someone else. I would feel like I was a failure if I didn't use what I've been shown. And I believe very much that God is a huge part of that because I, I didn't know where else to turn. And the one place I knew that I wouldn't be looked down on was in God's eyes. So I think meeting people that have gone through the same thing and talking to them makes you realize that uh, there's so much more to life than living in the past and living in the hurt. And it takes a long time to get over it. It isn't something that happens in a hurry. So now as women come in um, to New Hope Family Ministries or children come in and you see, it's amazing to have, this is I believe the first organization like this uh, in Ontario at least, that supplies the kind of ministry that we do, the kind of programs that we do for Christian women. So I'm not saying that uh, people without faith don't come because lots and lots of people don't have faith when they come there. But they certainly realize before they're gone that we do. And so that's part of my life story, that it's just amazing to me how it was all a plan in the, in, from the beginning, that it doesn't matter how much you've been hurt, you can let it destroy your life. You can live in that past and repeat the same things, which I've obviously done before and don't want to do again. I think I would be smarter this time. I hope I would be smarter this time. But when you, at least I find that when you've been abused, it would be very easy to be abused again. So unless you change the way you think, you seem to have this big sign that says, pick me. I think when you finally get through that, you can hold your head up and people don't look at you the same. I don't think that I give off the vibe that I'm a victim. And I, that's what I would really encourage every woman that's gone through this kind of thing, that it takes talking about it, it takes putting it behind you so that you can be victorious, so you can get on with your life. I'm just so thankful for everything that happened to me because I wouldn't be where I am today if that wasn't the case. So as uh, we no longer have the same board of directors that we started with, and we are um, definitely getting bigger in Woodstock, getting to be better known. It is hard to talk about the things that hurt so much 
to tell many people how much that hurt at the time because I don't hurt anymore. And that's the most wonderful thing. I don't hurt anymore. And I really believe that that can be for everyone. We can live in the past or we can make the choice to change our lives and to let God use us for who we really are, to let the hurts be gone and victory be here. I really appreciate you having me on the show today and it's nice to be able to talk to you. Well, and we appreciate the fact that you are willing to come here and open up and I think that it's great that it shows women that, you know, I, I kind of go with the theory that what happened to you when you are a child was not your fault and what you do with it as an adult is up to you yes. and you're a great example of the fabulous things that you can do with what was dealt you that maybe wasn't wasn't quite so good and wasn't, you know, the ideal path to where you are now, but I don't think you'd be as good at what you do now if you hadn't been where you'd been in the past. I agree with that very much. I think there's a reason why we go through things, so we can let it knock us down or we can pick ourselves up and say, I'm getting on with life. That's great. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today and sharing your story. Thank you. And now a few words of wisdom from a wonderful, wacky, one-of-a-kind woman, Jezebel Peppa, a woman of courage in her own right, who will share with us her thoughts on the themes of today's episode. Hello, darlings. Jezebel Peppa here. Darlings, have you ever had somebody make you feel unworthy? Have they been abusive with you? Have they made you feel like you're second rate? I'm going to remind you of an old saying, and that old saying is no one can hurt your feelings without your permission. Nobody can make you feel worthless without your permission. You need to start thinking and changing your thinking about how you deal with yourself and how you love yourself. In the end, nobody's opinion matters but the one person that's looking back at you in the mirror every single day. So make sure that you learn to love yourself. Don't give anybody permission to make you feel anything less than what you are. Celebrate that beautiful person that you are, and remember to celebrate the Jezebel in you. It all starts with the warm-up at 7, the game at 7.30, followed by the wrap. OMAC London Nights Hockey, only on Rogers. 14. The Woodstock Armories was built in 1904 to house the Oxford Rifles, the local militia military organization. The first local militia was formed in 1798 in Burford. They became known as the Oxford Rifles in 1814 after actively serving in the War of 1812. The organization grew until the Oxford Rifles were disbanded in 1954. Architects Nagel and Mills of Ingersoll designed the armories to have the appearance of a heavy fortress. It was two crenellated towers, though the building was never intended to be a defensive structure. Rather, it housed a gym, as well as a bowling alley in the basement for supplementary activities for Oxford Rifles members. The first floor served as an indoor parade and drill square, which could be observed from a stand-up balcony on the second level. The outdoor parade grounds were located directly south of the building, where the parking lot is today. The armories played a large role in the development of training in sports and recreation in Woodstock. To find out more, contact the Woodstock Museum at www.woodstockmuseum.ca. Thank you, Jezebel, and thank you, Linda. I know it took great courage for you to come on this show and tell your story to a television audience. You have certainly inspired us all today, and as our thank you gift, you will receive a copy of Ann Miner's book, Succeeding in Spite of Everything, and you will take home our beautiful centerpiece by Floral Occasions in Ingersoll and a collection of handmade chocolates from our own local chocolatier, Cindy Walker of Chocolate Tea in Ingersoll. Now, we would love to hear from our audience. Last season, many of you wrote to our guests directly to let them know how you had been inspired and encouraged by their stories. We would love to be able to share your comments and feedback on future episodes of Women of Courage. So please contact Anne directly by email at the address on your screen below, anne at anneminer.com. And of course, we would love it if you liked our Facebook page 
Women of Courage TV. Now remember, in every setback lies opportunity. Opportunity for you to call up all that you have learned through your own experience and through other people's stories and to rely on your core beliefs and values to rally your strength and your courage, to find your way through, to overcome and to succeed in spite of everything. Until next time, be courageous. If I were brave, I'd walk the razor's end Where fools and dreamers dare to tread And never lose faith Even when losing my way What step would I take today If I were brave? Bye.